Good morning. Thank you very much, first of all, to um, uh, Talking Galleries for inviting me a second time. It's very courageous of them. Um, and um, uh, I will, in fact, go on from where I left the last time. So I think it's very important to understand the context I'm, I'm starting from. I, I start with a few uh, precautions. Uh, I'm starting from that article that was um, written after my, my talk here. If you want to find it, you just Google Alain Servet, my name, with um, um, uh, art market industrialization. Um, you'll find it easily on Google. So the context where we are in is the one that was described by, by Mark yesterday uh, also. I mean, I'm a fan of art. I am a collector, and I, I truly, I think, deeply love art. Um, but I cannot ignore that today um, the art market has become a business. Uh, Mark calls it a business. I call it an industry. Uh, when I use that word, you know, in the art world, people think about you know, long chain of cars being built or washing machines and so on. This is not what is about an industry. An industry can be the luxury good industry, can be the media industry, can be anything else. An industry is a kind of an infrastructure which is organized for business. And I think it's important to understand that. So that's the context we are in um, uh, at this point. So uh, from that, I, 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 was, I want to raise some thinking. And as I will be touching uh, a very um, uh, sensitive subject on, um, in the art world, which is um, uh, the relationship between um, artists and galleries. Uh, you remember yesterday, Elizabeth named it uh, a relationship. I would call it, um, uh, no, sorry, a marriage. I would even call it a marriage without print-up contract and without MST test before, um, which is even more interesting. Um, but um, so it's touching a very sensitive subject. Many galleries, particularly from the older generation, are still thinking that as a sacred relationship. So that's why that rather than giving it a, a look at it uh, from the point of view of a collector or a finance guy, I decided to take a little strange format uh, today and to try to surprise you a little bit. That's why I'm, I'm growing my beard for five days. I'm wearing that turtleneck, so maybe I make you think about someone at one point. But <laughs> I'll be um, so making you a presentation to project you in the 21st century. Uh, you see, so um, it's um, it's not about the 20th century. Just try to forget about what you know about the art world. You know, uh, Lisa, forget about uh, the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century. And maybe there's another way of doing business. I've taken them out because they're not really fitting. So, but you understood what I meant, and I think you recognized the very brilliant guy. I'm not comparing myself to him, but it's just, um, just <laughs> to think about uh, broadening the view. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is um, artist agencies. Um, you know, my, my job as a, as a businessman and a, as an investment banker is really to try to understand the trends of things and try to, um, to understand it before everyone else and maybe sometimes to direct them. And I see that in the art world, we definitely need, and that's what I've been supportive of Talking Gallery so much, because I think definitely, as so many people said, it's very important to strategize. I think that's one of the, the words that will come out of this um, talk very much, is strategize. Strategize what art fair you're going to be doing, what artists you're going to be following, what, um, what you're going to do with your art space. It's about strategizing everything you're going to do. So, um, on, from that point of view, um, thinking about uh, another way uh, of doing business, I think, is, is quite important. So, um, I wanted to start with a little bit of a description. What, is, what are the main roles of a gallery? I sent an email to Edward Winkelmann before this talk, and I said, you know, you're the specialist on that field. You know, what about the, what you think the functions and the purpose of a gallery are? It was very interesting because he, he spoke a lot about um, the relationship to the artist, which is the core of what, what I will describe here at the later date. But I think there is more than this. Um, Mark yesterday mentioned something, um, I would call him Master Mark, because he spoke so well yesterday, and it's, we're all going to be referring to him as Master Mark now. Um, he, will, he, he said to discover arti young artists and get them. I think that discovery element is very, very important as well. Um, sometimes. Uh, Galleries um, are caring about it. Sometimes they forget about it a little bit. The second part is really to um, um, to support um, an artist to try to help him in, the, in his development, to so to to nurture uh, what he will be doing. I believe it's the second uh, element. The third is um, is um, is to sell the arts, as uh, as it was said yesterday as well. I like a quote from Marian Goodman. Um, 
The marketplace is important too. Artists need to live and sell, and that's my responsibility. So that responsibility of, um, of selling is also uh, very important. Behind that, there's also uh, all the element of the production. From what I hear from galleries, that's a big problem. The artist suddenly wants to build uh, a five meter high ceramic things that has never been built before. And uh, the, the galleries has got to get involved in that um, big problems to solve. Um, then there's, the, there's the, the PR, uh, which is included in the selling, but it's more and more important today. You know, how to contact the press, how to make the press aware, how to, uh, to make um, people aware of the um, the thing and uh, uh, one last element that I would describe, I would describe it kindly as um, as a kind of a babysitting uh, because artists are uh, very sensitive um, uh, human beings. So very often, and I've been um, seeing this quite often, uh, you know, the, the two o'clock WhatsApp about suddenly an existentialist. Uh, a crisis about you know what am I going to do for my next show and everything needs a, an immediate reply in every circumstances. So that's why I called all the, su the, the moral supports uh, from that point of view. So that's what I think um, are the, the, the standards, um, the, the broad uh, description of the functions uh, of a gallery. Now, how does it work in the in the real thing? And that's where uh, also my experiences, like Mark's yesterday, is, is a first-hand experience. Um, we spoke um, yesterday, Lisa mentioned yesterday, um, galleries stopped investing long term in artists for, uh, a long time ago. And that coming back to the description I made about the industrialization, it is quite logical. Um, because of the absence of contracts, um, that is one of my favorite subjects, as you know, Sylvia, um, because of the abs absence of contracts, um, it's quite difficult for galleries to be consciously investing in the long term for with an artist because they know that you can walk away uh, after one show, two shows, three shows. So, you know, it's a kind of a unbalance. Why would I invest? And then you have a lot of problems coming from, um, from, from that point of view. Um, so one of those, the problem linked to it is, um, is um, a long term investment um, in the, um, in the, uh, in the uh, artist. But there are, you know, more and more in that new environment, which is called the art market industry, there are things that are not working properly anymore. I'll give you a couple of examples um, that happened to me. Um, first of all, um, I was involved once with an artist, um, an English artist who had a gallery in Belgium, was trying to recover um, his works uh, from, from the gallery, but the gallery would not release them because they would say, okay, now you're leaving me and I would like to, um, that you cover some of my costs uh, for the art fairs where I've been presenting you. We spoke about that problem yesterday. It is not contractualized and suddenly it's coming up. And so what do you do um, from that point of view um, in those circumstances? So, one first um, uh, conflict of interest. Another case which was interesting as well was um, an artist, a Spanish artist um, at Arco. You have um, the white cube guys uh, coming to the booth, spending 20 minutes with the artists, uh, quite a long time, investigating the work and so on. And so the, uh, the, uh, the dealer comes to the galleries straight on and says, can you please send me a PDF about the work so that I, I understand the work and so on, because we could be brought to work together. And you know, in that case, the artist was quite happy. One month later, she uh, goes back to the galleries and said, you know, did you get any follow-up from White Cube? And the, um, then the, the galleries uh, said, you know, I didn't send the package, the PDF. So the artist was very surprised. Why didn't you do it? Just because, you know, if you start working with White Cube, it will be at a price range that will be much higher than, than my clients, my usual clients, so uh, we won't be able to work together. So. I cannot um, do it in those circumstances. Again, it doesn't mean that everybody is acting like this. Certainly not. It's just saying that it's happening. Um, another example um, was um, uh, a, a, a gallery that started working, an American gallery, uh, started working with an artist in the UK. Long discussions. The, the US gallery wanted to um, develop a relationship and do the first show as a kind of... Um, uh, of um, uh, retrospective of the work. Um, so the artist said, oh, great idea, let's do this. So but the works were in consignment in the gallery in the UK. So the, the galleries, uh, the US galleries, and the artist says, can you please release the works? The gallery says, no, I prefer not to release those works because I could have the chance to sell them and so on. So no, I, I'm not releasing those works uh, in those circumstances. Again, it's a kind of a conflict of interest in that case. 
Another um, example, first-hand example, was a um, young artist I know very well from Brussels. And he told me, Alain, what should we do? I mean, we have our gallery from Paris. They're showing some of our drawing in the, um, at the FIAC, which is very nice. But then we approached them and we asked them what the price was, and they said the price was 20,000 euro. And, but normally our price is 10,000 euro. So um, we approached the gallery and we said, you know, why are you doing this? I mean, our, our collectors will be so surprised, nobody will buy it to those, to those prices. And the gallery replied, you know, on the ground floor, on, on the FIAC, I cannot sell stuff at, at 10,000 euro. So I need, um, I need to, to raise the price, but it doesn't matter much. But it was obviously a problem for, um, for the artist very much. So in those circumstances where conflicts of interest are arising, you know, it is maybe the time also to notice one um, very special thing, is that uh, the art world is one of the only creative industry with no artist agent. You know, how come? Uh, have you ever thought about that, um, that element? I mean, there are agents for architects, for writers, for actors, for uh, footballers, for, um, for any kind of, uh, of creative industry but never for, um, for artists really in an organized way. So maybe, and that's why I'm here in black in front of you today, why don't we think about a possible model and try to think about it openly and not being reacting by saying, no, no, you're touching the very sacred element of my, of my uh, relationship and maybe it's different. Because you know, even from the other point of view, I had that case as well of galleries who are not so keen on the relationship to artists. You know, I had a gallery in Paris um, telling me last week uh, that she lost three kilos handling a Korean artist for their first show at the gallery, so difficult she was uh, in the different elements, and she really suffered from that, that element. So does it mean that she really want, wants, is keen to develop um, and to keep being involved in that element? You know, is it necessary to be absolutely uh, part of it? Let's, let's try to think about it, about just showing one, what, what could a model be. So, what could be a model of an artist agency? It would be a, a, a platform of knowledge. And I think that's very important. Um, and also, from that point of view, it is also introducing some elements of economy which are quite important. This is economies of scale. Because right now, what the gallery has got to do is that to cover a few of those elements that are necessary, and I will describe them now, they need to have dedicated people. Are they you know, able to pay them well enough to get the, the best service? It's not always clear. So one of them, one of the first of them is about the contract, whether you will like it or not. There are many contracts in the art world now, whether it's a, for a, a production of a, of a work for a, for a museum show or a biennale or um, whatever different elements. There is always elements of, of legal problems that are appearing, not even talking about um, the contract between galleries and artists. We spoke a lot about this. It's a very keen subject. Um, um, Dora Garcia yesterday mentioned that she would not be against, and I think there is quite a few artists that are in this field, but we must recognize as well that right now, when an artist sees a contract, and I've seen it, because sometimes they come to me and ask me to have a look at it, and sometimes they're so they always think, you know, I'm going to be screwed. Somebody will screw me up. Whoever is putting me a contract in hands, I cannot read it well, I cannot understand, so there's something wrong. I heard artists telling me, you know, I didn't sleep for three nights because I've got to sign that contract, and finally I took the decision not to sign it. Not because it was a bad contract, just because uh, um, she was not able to really handle the, the technology and the, the legal terms that were in the, um, in the, uh, in the, the contract. So, Obviously, in those conditions, the artist needs an independent um, point of view from that, from that uh, level. So the idea is we would have to have a platform. So one of the first service would be the um, a legal service that would be on the platform, you know, a dedicated lawyer that understands um, the, uh, the, uh, the way of doing business in the art world, which is not always 100% uh, following legality. Uh, we've seen that often, um, some flexibility, but still able to give a proper advice about what to do uh, or not to do. There's other elements that are appearing as well. Sometimes people approach me because as a banker, they think I know everything from that point of view. But it's also the social status. I mean, how should I get my social security? What status should I have? What social status should I have um, uh, here in this country? Because maybe I'm a Mexican living in, uh, in Belgium. And sometimes there's tax problems. I mean, where do I do my 
my, uh, my fiscal declaration? Do I, do I pay my taxes and everything? There's quite complex elements sometimes that um, it's quite heavy uh, for the galleries to, um, to solve. So if it is put in a, and also have any, an independent advice paid by, by the artist, it would be another uh, solution. The same for the production. Um, again, in terms of economies of scale, uh, you know, the artist is coming to, um, to, uh, to the gallery saying, OK, I want to now, I would like to create works in ceramics. But, you know, as a gallery, where do you find a ceramist that is happy to work on measurements? You know, not standard works, but on measurements. Um, do you have that under, under the elbow? Of course, I mean, yeah, everybody knows a couple of names here and there in Mexico or in, uh, in and so on, but it's not easy to arrange. Maybe if you also know some um, uh, ceramists that would be happy to work getting some work in return, that would be even better. Um, it's because there's some standards that could be um, also applied there. So, you know, also in terms of economies of scale, if you've got it on one platform serving many, uh, many different artists, then it's sometimes also helpful for the whole system as a whole. Um, PR, I mean, is it possible for, I mean, of course, the mega galleries today have got a, a, a special dedicated PR person in-house, but is it possible really to have a PR um, for every single gallery, particularly the medium-sized galleries, um, and of quality that is good enough to really to raise the awareness of a, of, a, of a show? So again, having one person on one platform could be certainly helpful too. And the same um, kind of the artist, artist relations, those artist relations are uh, very present um, as well in galleries. It's, a, it's quite a cost, as you know, in the mega galleries. There is also dedicated people, just artist relations. Um, again, you know, when you are one or two people or three people in the gallery, you know, is it possible to provide the, the service um, correctly? So, you know, the idea would be to create that platform. Again, it is not against the gallery at all. It's just a kind of you know, establishment of an of a independent uh, service platform, uh, competence platform, out knowledge platform outside uh, of the gallery. That would be, of course, interacting with the gallery um, uh, all the time when necessary, but also with free resources uh, from the gallery that would have less fixed cost because we saw in the new system that it's, it's a big problem for many, many galleries, is that the fixed costs of running the business have been increasing dramatically. Uh, it's, it's, it's been on the commercialization side, but also production. I mean, I remember the letter that uh, Jérôme de Noirmont wrote uh, when he decided to close the gallery. He said, you know, at this point, I would need to hire high quality people that would be very expensive uh, to keep doing my business. So would it be possible to keep doing the business if you were having that kind of, um, of platform that was giving us uh, an independent service? Um, it's not a confrontational, or contra you know, confrontational service, it would be just a complementary uh, service. Also, it would be fitting some of the needs of, um, of the galleries, because again, some galleries would rather maybe do um, one show, two shows, three shows, five shows, ten shows maybe, but sometimes they, they like a, a, a more loose uh, relationship. I think uh, Mark also yes, yes, said yesterday um, it is um, uh, also um, what should be the, the identity of a gallery if they cannot hold their artists for the long time. You remember when he spoke about um, the, the, the galleries growing with the artists, he said as well, you know, what would be the identity if you cannot hold to your artist all the time? The identity then should be the vision of the, um, of the, uh, of the gallery of the world. And I really like that expression. It's also fitting what um, uh, Stefania Bortolami said, you know, what she really writes in the, in the gallery business is writing art history. I like, I like that, um, that terms. Um, and another one about uh, Marianne Goodman again. Um, a dealer's genius is to shape a cultural landscape out of his, his or own, own instincts. And, and this good man has done more consistently and successfully than any living gallerist. So it's about writing um, uh, art history. You know, does it need that you have uh, always that um, uh, fixed relationship, that very costly, uh, and also without the, um, the kind of the cost uh, benefit of uh, economies of scale? So that's a little bit um, the idea. Now, how do you structure it? Um, there's one. Very important condition because you know artist agency kind of exists in one way or another here and there. There are some people calling themselves artist agent. What they do most of the time is selling the work of the artist. 
This is absolutely not the case. There should be one very clear condition to this artist's um, uh, agency, is that in no circumstances it would ever be selling work out of the studio. No circumstances. Someone approaching them, knowing that they are the, um, the agent of the artist, they would refer to the list of the three or four galleries that would represent, one, two, three um, galleries representing the artist, and they would refer to them. Um, so no circumstances, which means that obvious, obviously they're not competitors of the galleries. They're just complements of the galleries. And I think that's really a key element. So depending on, on, on this, you know, how could you imagine uh, remuneration? You know, I think something would be fair would be, first of all, an alignment of the interest of the, uh, of the artist agent with the, with the artist, which means that it should be based on how much the artist is selling. Um, so I would think that 5% coming from the artist on the turnover of the artist, and 5% coming from the gallery, depending on uh, the service provided to the gallery. I mean, it's really the gallery is able to reduce their fixed costs because of, of the service provided by the artist agent, then it makes sense in those circumstances. It's very possible that if we're talking about an artist working with, um, with, um, with uh, um, uh, a mega galleries, with the lawyers, the PR, the everything, okay, uh, the 5% could drop um, from the gallery because there would be service services provided by, um, by the gallery itself but still with the kind of the eye of the artist agent to make sure everything is fine, everything is fitting the usual, um, the usual best practices and so on. So it would be, I think, um, uh, quite useful. So that's roughly the model um, that's, um, that I think could be a potential solution to many problems for medium-sized galleries. You know, the fixed cost I mentioned, that, that, in that relationship to the artist, I think it would then make it a little bit easier to arrange a contract, you know, contract for three years, five years, ten years, depending on what, what we want. As Lisa said, there would not be the case of uh, an unbalanced uh, contract where sometimes the gallery uh, is imposing really um, leonine um, conditions or unfair conditions to the, uh, to the artist. So it would kind of rebalance um, um, and those, uh, those different elements. So I spoke to quite a few artists about that idea, asking them what they think about it. And the, the reply has been extremely positive because obviously it's looking a little bit, uh, we spoke about the difference between US and Europe. Um, in the US, the practice of creating a studio is coming very fast with an artist. The artist very quickly will create a studio, which in fact will cover a, co a few of the, of the, uh, of the functions I, I described here. But of course, the studio, again, no economies of scale, because you need to build it again from scratch, and you need to find the people with the knowledge that you need to have. So no economies of scale. So it could be still interesting for people with studio to um, delegate some of the, of the task, of the function, if it's well done in the artist uh, agency. In Europe, this, the studio practice is less um, spread out. So I think it's definitely meeting quite a lot of demand. And I had, I spoke also to, um, to some major curators, uh, you know, top 10 curators, and they said, you know, if ever this kind of thing was starting, you know, I could align you 20 or 30 artists that would be very interested in that kind of service right now. So um, again, I'm going to wrap it up from here because I want to raise ideas. I want to have Adam's uh, reply and reaction to it. And I want to have your reaction, which is just throwing an ID in the pound, which is the, uh, the point of uh, talking galleries um, in general. And, um, and to, um, to from there see whether we can describe some element of future. Adam? <coughs> Thank you very much uh, to Talking Galleries for bringing me here from uh, New York for this incredible event. It's been, um, I'm kind of speechless at the amount of information that's flowed through here already. And um, I know through social media, it has gone absolutely viral in the United States. And um, I'm hoping to be a proponent of, of what will happen even more so in the future on the American side. Um, Alain, thank you very much. Um, this is very interesting. Um, you have in many ways described my job <laughs> in terms of this idea of the artist agent. Actually, as president of the Art Dealers Association of America, uh, we very clearly state in our code of ethics that our responsibility is to act as the artist's 
agents, and that is the terminology that we use. Um, I like your um, relationship to Steve Jobs here. Uh, I like the fact that you are a blue sky thinker, an out of the box person. Um, it's the only way our industry is going to continue to thrive in the future is if we continue to look at things um, from a different perspective. And I think that's extremely healthy for all of us. Um, I think we live in a different kind of world now with a different model. And I agree with you very much on that. Um, I think we live in a world where the educational system and uh, those of us in esteemed professions are taught to be more right brain thinkers. You cannot live in a linear world anywhere where um, the way, say, Leo Castelli or Alexander Rosenberg did things is the way that I'm going to be able to, or Klauser, or any um, art dealer in the present and in the future. Um, so in terms of this, you know, I think about my role as a dealer and as an artist agent. And um, look, I'm a failed artist. I was probably the worst artist in the world. And the reason why I ended up in this profession is because it was as close to the mark of being an artist as I was ever going to get. Um, and I have learned the business of being an art dealer. Um, I think one of the things for me that's interesting is learning how to make uh, an artist's wildest dreams the very least that will ever happen for them. And um, in doing that, um, I actually really like the complexities of my job. Um, certainly, my life would be a lot easier if I just uh, graduated, got an MBA, went to Wall Street, went to work on Goldman Sachs, and became a collector. Um, I, for some perverse reason, decided not to do that. Um, so when you talk about certain aspects of the artist agent's responsibility, and again, I'm not minimizing anything that you're saying. There are a lot of extremely salient points, which we'll discuss, uh, which I think are extremely useful and complementary to what we do. Um, I think that um, one of the things I enjoy doing is having this sort of intangible right brain relationship with artists. Um, you talked about Marion Goodman uh, saying that, and I agree with you, I mean, a lot of us are very well respected in our field. Marion is revered. She is clearly considered the gold standard. Um, and she does things in a very specific way. The idea that you referred to the term instinct, um, again, goes back to this sort of right brain world that the art dealer, um, gallerist, or agent has to live in. We have to be able to do things that are more than just merely commercial. We have to wear a lot of hats. And I agree, some of us are better than others at that. Uh, we need to be instinctual. We need to be um, perceptive. We have to have empathy. Uh, we have to have a sense of, well, we don't have to, but I think uh, humility uh, is a virtue that doesn't hurt us uh, at the end of the day. Um, and Interestingly enough, I think that artists respond to that kind of sensitivity. And I think about the role of the artist's agent, and it makes me wonder a little bit um, who this person would be. Um, I know that you know I don't have a legal degree, but if my artist has an issue that's uh, legally related, um, we certainly can collectively or independently uh, go and talk to one of the great art lawyers, a Joe Laird or a John Silberman, about these situations, people who specialize in this area. Um, the gallery has very competent uh, financial advisors. If the artist has a situation like that, we could certainly introduce them to those kind of sources also. Um, I think it's interesting also because what you're talking about is a very real issue. The problems that you have encountered and you talk about at FIAC, for instance, or production, galleries not releasing work, people not sending PDF. This does happen, um, and I'm not going to deny it. Um, I think and I really believe that it's anomalous. I think it happens in very, very few situations. I think it happens in a very stratified kind of gallery. And I think that um, 
there are ways that it can be avoided, and I think it's the responsibility of the dealers to work together in order to make that sort of um, agreement happen so that at the end of the day, A, we're working for the artist, and B, we can keep them out of anything that's unpleasant that they don't necessarily want to be involved in or cannot be the best advocate for it. Um, and Dave, if I may interrupt you for one no, second. No, please. Um, it's a dialogue, and I welcome it. It's, uh, I agree with that. You know, I, I said in the current way of doing things, um, this is a very probable development, the artist agency. One other thing, and that's why I'm supporting Talking Galleries for so long, and I said it again yesterday, you know, I would like the industry, again, don't take industry as a bad word. Uh, I would like the industry to create best practices, because mm -hmm. if there were best practices, yeah. then it would reduce the, um, the happening of those kind of things. Sure. You know, I, I, f I forgot to mention another practical example, which was not a marginal gallery. It happened in Chelsea under your nose, you know, the Blumenthal Todd Levin uh, story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what was it? A kind of a, another finance guy coming, opening a gallery, yep. spend, mm -hmm. talking a lot about things, getting a young artist from, uh, from the MFA at Yale, uh, successful guy, right. giving him a show, doing a sellout show of the whole thing. Of course, Marian Buski noticing him, starting to talk to him. The uh, artist obviously was not intending to spend his life with, uh, <laughs> with Blumenthal uh, and saying, okay, I'm jumping ship and I'm going to, um, to, uh, to Buski. And what happened is that then um, uh, uh, Blumenthal, and then the artist said, but I did a sellout show at 25,000 for 13 works. Where am I 200? for $50,000, mm. and the, mm. Uh, mm. the galleries then said, uh, no, sorry, I'm keeping back um, 150 because um, it's my promotion cost of you, and you, you left me. So again, what I mean is that numerous examples that are really existing, and also you know, a law that has been passed in Manhattan, which, um, which makes it um, some kind of illegal or felony or whatever for uh, a gallerist to, res to get the, the money that is the result of a sale on his personal accounts. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, um, but that <laughs> happens in the US, that does not happen in Europe. And right mm. now everything is mixed up and the number of time that I heard, you know, of course the artist is paid, but only after the gallery has paid his, his um, gallery booth, his transport, his insurance, the light, the electricity, yeah. and you know how many problems of, of that sure. kind that there is. So my idea, of course, there's a way of reducing it, but then let's agree on, Let's agree as an industry, not let's let you agree on as an industry uh, on best practices. Sure, um, sure. That sure. should be, you know, ma like the ADAA, your code of mm -hmm. ethics, and, you know, being member, I suppose it is checked out, it should be checked out, like in any other industries, like real estate agents, stockbrokers, um, you know, architect, order of architect, order of, uh, of doctors, of, um, uh, you know, why is there no artist agent, no uh, professional organization in the, uh, in the art world in the current circumstances where kind of money is big enough to bring the bad guys uh, mm. in the area. Mm. So that's, that's a little bit why I think that otherwise there will need to be an independent um, uh, thing mm. doing mm. part of your job. And of course, I was not speaking about, I mean, you are just in the lower top tier as a gallery, but you are one of those mega galleries, you know, representing Louis Bourgeois and, and super big names like those. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you are very well equipped. Um, but I'm more talking about, you know, the two, three, four five um, uh, employee gallery right. um, mm -hmm. that's really, I mean, how can they cope with all those costs? And also by keeping the artist, because very often, you know, if the gallery cannot provide this mm -hmm. service, the artist will move somewhere else. Right. That will be one of the reasons. So I'm really thinking about how can you provide some support to the mid sized gallery, which mm -hmm. everybody agrees are the most um, um, uh, in trouble right now. So. How can you do that? Because an extension, of course, of the, uh, of the uh, artist agent would be production companies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know it starts happening. Sure. But to make it really happen that someone will bring, I mean, a finance guy will say, okay, I'm happy to finance works of art for, you know, it happens now. Noirmont, by the way, very, very interestingly, started an, a production company. And I, I noticed... Alain Noirmont. No, Jérôme, Jérôme, oh, Jérôme, Jérôme de Noirmont. Jérôme de Noirmont. So I've seen them. I think they produced uh, quite a few works in the um, 
in some of the Biennale I went recently. And it's very interesting because then, you know, the role of a medium-sized gallery would be, you know, building on, on something that exists. And again, mm -hmm. in any mm -hmm. other field, and that's a little bit what I'm bringing to the yes. table, yeah. is that yeah. looking at any other industries, yes, you can take off the shelf some services. Mm -hmm. You know, but those services do not exist in the art world. This is, uh, this is what interested me about this subject, because, um, you know, uh, when I was asked to respond to you, um, it was in a very timely situation, because I had just read Judd Tully's article on bloam.com about um, can the single venue gallery survive? And I kept thinking, uh, yes, this is something that I, I believe deeply in. And is this idea of the artist agent, somebody who is functioning for the artist, is this a way to complement those single venue galleries and allow them to continue to survive and thrive so that we can enter into a partnership that is healthy and at the end of the day works ultimately for the artist because that's really what we're doing this for. Um, is this a way to alleviate or maybe complement some of the responsibilities of what we do in an equitable fashion so that um, I can get my artist the next museum show, so that I can be on the road to do something and um, encourage a new foundation to make a very significant game-changing acquisition because I have a partner who is going to finance the next, um, you know, say, uh, major installation. And so that I won't have to go out there and use up one of my collectors, who otherwise I would use to buy something to finance this, that I then would have to sell and maybe split the profits with them. Um, so I think there's a lot of merit to this idea, which, you know, if I didn't agree with you on a number of terms, I wouldn't be here. I would I say I cannot have a, a, a conversation that opens this idea up to the pros and the cons. Um, with that in mind, you know, I'm very curious. Um, it's hard to wear a lot of hats. You do it. I do it. Um, you call it babysitting. I call it psychiatrist. <laughs> um, it's actually something that I quite enjoy. Um, Within the gallery system, Elizabeth, I'm sure you know this very well, um, we kind of call it puttering. You know, when an artist calls up and they say, oh, you know, I put a new mark on a painting and I, I really want you to come up and talk to me about it. And I know that that mark will cost me probably a hundred dollar dinner and three hours of my evening. But I'm happy to do it because I know this is what I signed up for. Now, within that conversation, it may lead to something. It's also something that validates this relationship. But did, um, I, mean, did I mean it should disappear? No, 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 no. And that's not what I'm getting at. So please don't, no, don't no, no, take exactly. it the wrong way. I'm wondering, this artist agent, it's very hard to wear a lot of hats. I come to it with uh, a great deal of training and experience from being a failed artist. Um, sometimes I'm so sensitive that I tell to the staff in the gallery, just think of me as maybe the most difficult artist you have ever encountered uh, before you sit down and we discuss something. So how do you find somebody who is going to be able to do all of these things um, and give you the confidence for legal advice, financial advice, uh, development of careers, et cetera, uh, in one person? I mean, because that's do, what I do. do. Do you think it would be one person? I've absolutely, I've no. I don't you know, know. If you if you want to shape it up, I'm not talking about one person. I'm talking about a platform that could serve fifty, a hundred artists. So, in terms of the remuneration, I mean, how many how many how many actors are um, helping CAA or UTA? Well, you tend to have an agent and a manager. Yeah, you can right. have. I mean, the manager, so, the manager will still be the galleries. There's no doubt about okay. it. I'm talking about a competence platform, and you describe it perfectly. It's for the medium-sized um, <laughs> gallery to be able to provide the full quality service okay. without cutting the corners, sometimes right, at right, difficult right. times, sure. um, that makes it possible. And 
you know, I'm here because I, I truly love art and I want to defend. And I mm. know how difficult it is right now. I know how right. difficult it is for the, the medium-sized gallery to defend themselves against the megas coming and picking up what I call the VBAs in that article, the very bankable yeah. artists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. either you create rules, again, at the industry level where there is a kind of um, a rewards or protection things uh, that are agreed right. that you would pay something, whatever, you, it's possible to reduce. But right now, uh, it's the, as I said, uh, it's the law of the jungle in the art world. Mm -hmm. It's the law of the strongest. Uh, you know, when Lisa was saying about uh, the gallery offering her an unbalanced contract, it's because the gallery felt sh there was in position of strength. You know, if if I'm I'm if I am um, if I am saying to Anna that I'm going to buy a work from her and I change my mind one month later, I mean, I would probably come to her and say, sorry, Anna, I changed my mind. And she will have no possibility to, re to react to me. If mm -hmm. I do the same at Gagosian because he thinks he's bigger than me, then he will sue me. So you see, it's all a question yeah. of everywhere. It's a question of force. And I don't like that situation yeah. where, uh, you know, a kind of a humanist uh, endeavor, which is art, is mm -hmm. right now submitted to only the law of the strongest. Yeah, it brings up a very interesting idea that um, was discussed yesterday, which is this idea of, is there a power struggle between the gallery and the artist, or even between the gallery and the collector? And, um, you know, I was really taken by the comment that said, um, some artists feel that they are in the passive role. And um, it's interesting because, you know, where I come from, we always believe that we defer to the artist. Sometimes even when they're not necessarily right, we will do it because it's part of keeping the harmonious relationship. Um, I like the fact that this empowers an artist to have a voice that is on equal standing with the dealer so that we can reach uh, a situation where there is no ill will being harbored because of a misunderstanding or because they feel that they don't have the voice necessarily to um, be an advocate for themselves. And certainly because I was an artist, I understand that sometimes you don't feel that you're in the position to do that. So having somebody be your voice with your gallery is not necessarily a bad idea. However, does it create yet a third entity in this world? And I'm, I'm treading on some very dangerous uh, area here, and I really wasn't sure whether I was going to bring this up, but I'm going to go there because I'm sure you have feelings like I do about it. Um, is this going to create interference the way these art advisors do? Um, you know, there was a great book um, that I read recently, and Georgina, I think you wrote it, that said, uh, <laughs> um, and there was an anonymous quote that said, um, anyone with a pair of Lobotons and an iPhone can call themselves an art advisor. <laughs> now, there are people who are going to jump on board with this idea of, wow, I can make 5%. I can interfere in the relationship with the gallery. Maybe I can get them to move to my friend's gallery. How do we prevent that from happening? How do we but stop a rogue entity from en entering uh, what's already a complex, fast, in the best words, turbulent state of affairs right now? Yeah, right, right now, of course, there is, um, you, you mentioned the art advisors industry, but everybody agrees, and there was another article in the New York Times that you remember, uh, where they were saying, okay, you've got those kids uh, and those Louboutin girls, um, you know, <laughs> uh, jumping on the back of the work that has been done by Thea Westreich and Ethan Wagner oh, yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, and Sandy Heller yep. and all those guys, yep. uh, okay? But again, you know, how much do they get? It's a little bit like the finance industry again. I mean, who, of course, there are crooks everywhere in my industry a lot. Sure. Uh, but of course, now it's more regulated and you go to jail quite fast with it. Um, but mm. it's, um, mm. you know, what's the percentage of what they get? Because really, I don't believe, because I hear so many people that are calling themselves artist agent. But I'm really, I'm asking them, you know, seriously, what are you bringing to the artist? Yes. When I'm talking about really a platform, 
it is really a professional platform. Mm -hmm. I'm really talking about um, a trained lawyer on board, which is, will not be in contact with the artist all the time. It will intervene only when it's necessary. Okay? There will be artist agents, you know, maybe covering five, six, ten, uh, depending on how many artists, maybe five maximum mm -hmm. artist agents, which will be the contact when the artist can call at any time. I'm calling about a serious professional platform, uh, and that will make the difference. I mean, because of course you cannot justify five and five mm -hmm. just for being there. Like today, I hear also so many, uh, uh, even me, I mean, I'm a s uh, supposed to be a, a well known collector, so I'm, I hear sometimes galleries, I mean, how do they dare to do this? But some people, of course, I, I don't want to say move away from me or whatever when I'm going to gallery, but I hear that sometimes. Uh, you know, a kind of an art advisor that I accompanied me to a gallery, then oh is trying God, to get yeah. something from a get from the gallery. Uh, so of course, oh I mean yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I know this only too well. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I mean, do I do I believe that we should not do it? Art advisors should disappear because there are few people like this. No, I'm saying okay, those one will. I mean, sorry for the people that are falling for it. Uh, it's their problem, um, mm -hmm. and I see some of my friends, you know, studying as a as as a collector. Sometimes they have had advisors, and I really ask them, you know, what are they doing for you, really, to justify? And have you signed a contract with them? I don't want to fall in the Bouvier mm -hmm. story, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. yes, I really truly believe what I'm talking about here is not. Uh, an army of Louboutin girl finding an, a, a kind of a, um, a second life. Um, <laughs> I am talking about um, a, a well serious. Put. Well put. I, yeah. I, I, I'm really talking about a serious professional organization because I really truly believe this is a serious industry. It's not about serious money because it's again peanuts. Uh, let's remember that. You know, I always like that thing because sometimes the art world thinks about itself like I'm the center of the world. You know, I'm the biggest thing ever. Yeah. You know, the, the famous the famous fifty three billion dollar that that um, McAndrew girl that I still don't believe uh, mentioned as the and everybody's repeating this figure. I mean, fifty three or fifty four billion dollar is is the amount of pet food that the U S. Uh, consumer are consuming every year. Mm -hmm. Only the U S. one. So. I mean, so that means Americans are buying more pet food than, than artists buy it bought and sold across the whole world. So mm. it's not that big an industry, uh, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. But still, it's, um, it's still... Um, Good analogy. <laughs> just to give a kind yeah. of a measure. Sure. But still, uh, it is a very serious thing. I, mean, I was speaking about it with, with Mercedes yesterday, who was trying to, working hard to bring more attention in Spain to art. Mm. And I said, you know, how can you do it? It's really about making politicians and everybody involved of the importance of arts. And I'm really mm -hmm. serious about it. I don't take art as a hobby or as an investment or whatever. I really think it can help maybe improve the world, if not changing it. So when I'm saying Absolutely. all this, I'm talking about, you know, how can we make that you know, the industry works better, that maybe there's uh, a rebalancing of that relationship of the, s the s powerful versus the, the medium. Mm -hmm. The medium-sized galleries sometimes don't even have the time. You know, I was asking a gallery from Barcelona, how the hell are you not here this yesterday yeah. and this morning? You're in Barcelona, I'm traveling from, you know, quite far away. Not so far away, but you're quite far away. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all relative. But he said, you know, I'm going to Artisima and blah, blah, blah. I have no time. But, you know, sorry, guys, stop sometime and mm. think. Mm. If you cannot do this, you're running and suddenly the wall will be in front of you or you, you're going to be fall. I love that thing about you falling and, you know, you hear the guy falling and every fall he says, you know, so far, so good. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay? exactly. exactly. <laughs> Until, boom. Yeah. So, and unfortunately, it happens all the time. I hear too often so many good galleries closing. You know, mm. when I, I was in, in FIAC, I saw two galleries, now director of, 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 of uh, mega galleries. Mm. I mean, uh, or, or Bolte, auction Bolte houses. Lang, first, yeah. yeah, Bolte Lang. Uh, the guy said, Hi, oh, yeah, how are you? I said, What are you doing here? Oh, yeah, now I'm working. I don't remember whether it was Wiener, White Cube, or Listen. I don't remember. But, uh, and two, uh, previous gallery from Berlin, now director of other, and so many of them. Uh, it's a second job for them, too. Yeah, so sure. I really sure. want to give the chance that maybe they can go on with their business um, in another way. Mm. 
not everyone will need to do this. I can be pretty sure that Sylvia will never do it, but you know, some other people can. So, oh, that's uh, a maybe. That's a maybe. Okay. That's a miracle. Yeah. So, <laughs> I I like uh, and I respect and appreciate your belief in art above all. I think that um, I think it's wonderful that you can discuss art on a holistic level and have this notion of industry, as you call it. Um, I think these are both very real things. They're um, very much a part of the dialogue of the world in which we live. Um, and I just didn't want to forget that, you know, uh, this idea of art as the higher calling, too, and we can all discuss this. And, you know, we've had brilliant writers in the 20th and 21st century, like Arthur Danto, who talk about this. Um, Sean Scully gave a lecture at the Pinacoteca in Sao Paulo. Um, and I, I don't want to, I cannot paraphrase him because he's an extremely intelligent and articulate man. Um, but he was talking about how art is basically the opposite of war. And it was a very interesting point. So I appreciate that you share, um, you know, a deep understanding with art on a higher, as a higher entity. Um, getting back, though, to the artist agent idea, I'm intrigued by this notion of the uh, compensation. I think that the idea of 5% here and 5% there is one that logically makes sense. Um, I'm just wondering, um, that would then put the financial success of the agent uh, beholden to the success of the dealer, right? And the artist. And the artist, exactly. So that in essence, if everybody does their job better, then we all do better at the end of the day, right? Um, this works certainly for artists with a very, very high production rate, high, um, uh, relatively low costs, uh, big output, uh, artists who are regularly shown at art fairs, uh, they can provide their gallery with work on a regular basis. Um, not every artist is like this. Uh, do you think it's fair to say that not every artist should have an agent? That a huge part of the population is actually better served just working directly with their dealer. If I am an artist in my 70s and it takes me a couple of months to make a painting and then I send it into the gallery and in, you know, under good circumstances a week later or so, um, it's sold. 30 days later I'm paid. Uh, I have accumulated some sort of security over the years. Do I need to even think about this? Am I too late in the game? Um, are there people that this model just isn't practical for. Yeah, of course, it, it's an ID, so you need to, uh, there are always exceptions to everything, but I would just give, a, again, a comparison with the, um, the, um, the Thea Westreich and so on uh, of mm. this world. I mean, it's, um, the arts, and I see it because I see so many people now, I really am serious, every two weeks I've got um, a venture approaching me to s look at their business plan and say, okay, what can we do? Do you want to make mon put money in that thing? So I see, I These really are see arts, arts uh, Yeah, arts, okay. things around the art, whether it's okay. um, transport, whether it's, um, it's um, uh, collection management, it's all kind of different things. Mm -hmm. One thing where I recognize that maybe someone has got a future is that when they understand that key thing, yes, it is an industry, but if the first point is to make the maximum money, you will not make it in any circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, Thea, Sandy, and you know, they're not working for money. I mean, they're doing it for the money. Of course they make money mm -hmm. out of it, but is it the prime objective of what they do in the art world? I don't think so. No. Um, and you know, when I saw it, uh, I, was, I was last week at a, a seminar about conservation of digital arts. And someone that was asking, okay, now you're using, it's quite technical, but you're using emulation based on Windows, but you're putting mm. them online. So what does Windows say? Because you're infringing on their copyrights, okay. because you're creating something that works like a Windows 6 to uh, emulate something. And the answer was, you know, right now, uh, Windows, despite the way so aggressive they are at protecting their copyrights, mm -hmm. you know, they, they for sure now that we are there and we are putting this online, okay? 
but then not, no one has even sued us because they know it's about art. Okay? So even big corps like this mm -hmm. understand the difference. So again, if you're creating an artist agency just for the money and with really that objective of maximizing everything you do yeah, and taking out the artists that are not making enough money, sorry, you will not last no. long. So again, you need, uh, it, it is not an art, it, it's not about, because sometimes you know, dealers or galleries feel offended by what I'm saying because they feel, oh, we're going to become like Wall Street. No, I don't think Wall Street ID would work ever. Yeah, many of us rejected Wall Street very early Fine. on. But I'm just saying, you know, in injecting a little bit of the, the good things and with keeping that idea that we are working for the art eventually. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody does. Um, yeah. uh, you know, it can raise something. But, you know, I'm working with other ventures in, in, mm. in Israel and so on. And, and I keep telling them because they are tech guys. I say, guys, I mean, if you believe always about maximizing the profits, the art world will never accept you. Never because they're going to feel it immediately, okay? And yep. that's, you know, we spoke about trust in the art world. For sure, you need to build trust. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe why I'm, I've got the honor of sitting on these chairs that maybe some people are still accepting that I'm a true collector in some way. And that's why I like the, um, yep. that thing. Um, yep. You know, if yep. I was yep. just a finance guy, and, and if, again, if we mm -hmm. compare different style, I mean, I spoke about Ethan and, uh, and Sandy, but I'm, as, as Mark said yesterday, I really respect Stefan Simchovitz and I really admire what he's doing at this disruptor. As I wrote in a Twitter, I cannot hate a disruptor because uh, it's so nice to have disruptor, <laughs> certainly in the art world. But what I don't like this is hiding as a Che Guevara uh, of the art world when, in fact, he's looking to maximize um, the bank account at the end of the day, mm. even if he will never recognize it and he will hate me. Uh, Stefan, thank you for your Facebook pages you're going to write based on this. But, um, you know, uh, that's what I, I got doubts about, really. And that's why, you know, in right. a way, the art world rejects him in some way, because we don't know where... It, if it's about the money only, it will not work. So uh, to answer your question precisely, um, you know, what about the artists that are not fitting, not producing, not selling enough? You know, the guys that will say, look at this book every year, like a corporate guy, and say, hmm, this one underperforming. And so on. Come on. I mean, the artist will not uh, go on that platform anymore. Yeah. I think to sum up, you cannot... Uh, look, I have long since stopped trying to um, assess the art world according to economic principles. And this term underperforming is one that I have never heard a dealer ever say. So I think it's a, an interesting idea, artist agencies, and uh, it's certainly... Um, uh, something worth pursuing in terms of uh, the concept. Do you want to open up to some questions now from the audience? Um. I have a question um, here Who's on the talking? left left side. Oh, my right. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> on your right. Um, I think I like the idea of agent. I think it exists already. I mean, I have um, encounters with agents before. Um, I, I would see it more personally at the beginning of the career of an artist rather than, you know, when he's um, uh, very big in his production and obviously he's already wanted by different galleries. And um, to come back to Stefan, you know, there was a problem with an African artist called Ibrahim Mahama where oh, yeah. he got sued. Um, mm -hmm. And part of the problem is that he didn't have a contract with his galleries. Um, and he got sued by a guy like Stefan in the US. The poor guy is in Ghana, you know, has absolutely no idea of, you know, the art world. And he's, he's being sued for $4 million, which is completely absurd. But I do believe that um, if he had an agent, because he doesn't have a contract with any of the galleries yet, mm -hmm. and that structure with the lawyer plus, you know, any kind of, um, um, you know, protection uh, field around him, you know, mm. to um, uh, with help. But I see it much more useful at the beginning of the career than later when he's obviously taking on by your gal galleries who should do and have that yeah. role for him. This is interesting, Toria, also because, um, Alain, I'll let you answer this no, because no. it's your platform. But I'm just thinking about what Toria said yesterday, which is that a lot of the artists from the continent, and this is an area that's of particular interest to me, um, because of my family background, that um, 
What's your family uh, background? From South Africa, okay. emigrated from okay. Eastern Europe to South Africa okay. uh, in the 30s. They, um, these are artists who don't have galleries. There is no gallery structure per se, the extent that we have it in the United States or Western Europe. So they may benefit very seriously from having an artist agent, especially at a time when they're in the Venice Biennale and on an international stage which will expose them to all sorts of problems. Yeah, beginning of end of a career, I think it's very clearly that, um, again, if you develop it as a, as a business, and again, it's not a dirty word to speak about business, please. I mean, a business means that you can keep doing it and paying everyone. It's not a bad thing, okay? So, not at all. Yeah, but for some, maybe some gallery, they, it's, not no, it's so not used to make money that they find suspect anybody doing is making money. So um, that's the problem. Um, is um, of course you need to balance. Uh, of course you want to get involved with young young artists uh, in some way and. Um, but in, in others, um, you need, of course, the cash flow necessary to make it work. So you cannot start only with young artists. And it's particularly, I see the problem appearing mostly from what I heard from the, the artists coming back to me. It's when an artist starts having multiple galleries, um, then the problem starts um, happening. You know, how, how do I sell a work which is in, other, in the other gallery in New York? Because sometimes it's attached to it some production cost. So how does it work? I mean, what's the commission of the whole thing? You know, it's from that point of view that the trouble happens. At the beginning of a career, I really strongly believe that, yes, the relation, I mean, it, it's kind of an um, adoption uh, in some way. I see, and I, I, I really see also, also as a collector, you know, I see that, an artist with one gallery will very often not sell from the studio. When the artist has got three or four galleries, then it's much easier for him to kind of sneak out some stuff um, in some way. So I think mm. the natural environment would be mid-career artists as well. Um, also, you know, again, um, uh, coming from the finance world, um, I'm providing services which are sometimes a little bit more sophisticated, but it's really for people starting at $1 million. Why? Why? Because those guys have got an experience already, and they know that if they go at the next shop that they get and the advertising that you do on, on, on CBS News and so on and so on, I mean, you're going to be losing some money. But after having lost some money many, many times, then you're more aware of paying for a service, if you understand what I mean. Mm. So, you know, you need kind of, and a mid-career artist has had some problems. A young artist maybe will think, oh, no, that's fine, you know, my gallery is fine enough. Uh, I don't need consignment agreement and, you know, all those mistakes uh, that are done sometimes um, at the mm -hmm. beginning of a career. But um, when, when you're mid-career, you're more aware and more ready to understand some kind of rule that you understand you need to put some rules in the thing. So mm -hmm. to answer your questions, um, I think the natural habitat would be um, mid-career artist, and definitely th there would be uh, an interesting young artist as well, but uh, depending on the thing. But, and when you say it exists already, you know, I really haven't met a single artist agent that was not selling the work. So it was a kind of a, a, a gallery without, mm. without art space. It's not, they call themselves artist agent, but they're not. You know, it was funny, uh, at the Lyon Biennale, they had a guy standing there in front of the work of the artist, and he was artist agent, okay? Um, and he was from the, um, from the, the Northern mm. Africa, um, uh, and the guy was standing there, I'm artist agent, but you're artist agent of what? I mean, you, know, you want to sell me the work there in the museum, so that's, that's not what I mean, that's not what I have in mind. Well, the one that I've met kind of like find like, you know, um, an agent for a musician would find gigs for the musician. It was more about finding, you know, where the, he could place his artists, you yeah. know, in group shows and things like that and finding opportunities for them. Sure. But um, We're gig getters. Yeah. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah, it's true. It's true at a, at a very high uh, level probably, but like uh, uh, for young talents, you know, it's probably finding the right galleries for them, you know, at mm -hmm. the beginning of their career is like finding, you know, a way for them to be present in a show internationally, et cetera. So I can imagine that this is uh, what I was thinking about. One little thing I forgot, we, because we had a discussion on the phone before. 
again, to show the interest uh, of the galleries in this. You know, let's take the example of the famous Kroek Dan Vo story. Mm. You know, mm. very unfortunately for Isabella Bortolozzi, um, as, as Adam was yeah. mentioning, she's the biggest loser of the whole thing because she lost the artists. Not only this, but I added to Adam that he forgot that element that because I, I read the whole judgment that she's condemned to 10,000 euro per day of delay of Danvo. She's solidarily um, uh, liable to it. That means that, you know, when you're a gallerist, you are taking some risk in that thing. Mm. Um, and because she was supposed to be part of the, of the deal. Yes. Um, so again, you know, sometimes giving some stability and, you know, I really liked the discussion that there was two years ago about artist contract. I mean, people don't realize there was never a contract with Dan Vo and Bear Croak. Everything was based on emails and, and, and witness. And let's not, not forget the basics of, of law is that, you know, to have an agreement, you just need right. uh, witnesses uh, to that yeah. agreement. That and, was so awesome. and sometimes when you don't mm -hmm. sign contract, you are putting you in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. That was also a very complex, relatively complex agreement between the artist, the dealer, and the gallery, and it should have been uh, put um, before a legal counsel. No question about it. I agree with you. But the dealer should have done that. And maybe they don't have the means, or maybe it's not their cup of tea. I mean, you know Isabella, yeah. you, as you imagine in her in sure, front of, terrific a, dealer, of, a good suit, eye. of a suit and, and, and tie lawyer. No, I don't see her sitting in front of one of those like this. So, Unfortunately, but it's the yeah. way it is. So why yeah. should she be involved with this? And this is what the law determined. You know? And unfortunately, she's losing against a bad, bad boy, bad guy, mm. because the guy was more vicious than them. Missy Serbia, always a good question there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's a very interesting concept. I'm just going to go back to your relation to sports agents for a second here because of um, in the sports industry, you would have the team owner that sets a budget. You would have the coach that wants the player. Then you would have the team manager that speaks to the player's um, agent. So there's more people involved than in our industry. Uh, so it's more complex. And what happens at times is that, um, unfortunately, these agents are looking at percentages they will get. So they will choose um, the team for the player, not according to um, how mm. that team is going to help in developing the sportsman's career, but whether the percentage is bigger or not. Um, so I'm just wondering how this platform or yours would, let's say, accommodate that kind of um, thing. Mm. And also, on the other hand, um, I feel that there should all, this platform, if it could in a way also educate the artist to think for sure. themselves more instead of taking that additional 5% from the artist. Fine. Um, yeah. Um, first of all, my Latin Greek um, uh, culture tells me that comparison is no reason. That means that you should not extend. When I spoke about uh, agent in sport, it's not the same. Second, I would recommend you to watch um, that f movie with Tom Cruise. Um, you know, Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Um, show me the money. Show me the <laughs> money. You know, you have good good culture, and like I see. But okay, again, you know, of course, you've got good agents, bad agents, and I, I'm not saying that everyone will be good, and only the good one, like Jerry, will make it through after mm -hmm. difficult times. And after, you know, I love that thing where he says, well, we're going to change the ethics of this business and everything, and he writes that letter at the middle of the night, and suddenly no one around him in the office is <laughs> co-signing co the thing. So, and then he says, okay, I'm going to be leaving. Who's leaving with me? Yeah, and then you have just that other actress just standing up with this um, fishbowl thing. Ladies uh, Anyway, it's a joke, but um, <laughs> of course, I mean, I, again, I'm not saying that I've got a full stuff, everything, everybody aligned. I'm just saying, think about it. Um, think about it. Is it a bad idea? Fine, I go back to my collecting and not to speak about it anymore. But just think about it. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Thierry Renya from the Netherlands. Um, 
I, I, I really thank you for bringing this up because I think that there is indeed a, 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 an inconsistency in our uh, actual gallery model. Uh, the conflict of interest is, I think, at base there. Um, on the other hand, I, I also think that perhaps the, the word agent here uh, might um, confuse a lot of us because uh, I support your idea of, of having uh, an, a true artist agent um, but as you are saying, um, the agents that we already know uh, are always uh, also involved in selling. Um, w would it not be better to, to perhaps think of, of concepts as uh, associations of artists, uh, which, which would uh, perhaps uh, have more objective uh, uh, notions towards the gallery as an agent? Again, I'll be very short answer. Um uh, you write, but then it remembers me what happened to uh, Elizabeth yesterday. Uh, the last question she asked, she said, um, Lisa, what you, would you think about formalizing your relationship to the uh, galleries and everything? She did a very long sentence and then threw the dirty words, contract, okay? <laughs> because she didn't dare starting a sentence with contract because contract is like, <gasps> galleries are like, oh no. I don't want contract in my love relationship with my artist, okay? So, okay, you can change the name if you want. I don't care. I mean, call them friends of the artist, friend of the art. I mean, but again, I'm a stupid finance guy. I mean, I call it when it's blank, it's blank. When it's a cow, it's a cow, and that's it. So, we call them agreements. Okay, <coughs> call him whatever you want. It's a friendlier word. Agreements are understandings, and that's what they are. Uh, hello. Huh? Oh. Who's that? Here. Here, here, here. Where's here? Oh, hi. Oh. Hi. <laughs> so I'm Mexican, living in Germany. Cool. Having I love a gallery. Mexico. Viva Mexico. Viva oh, Mexico. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have a gallery. I'm an artist, a curator. I had contracts. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Very transparent. And some artists, they say me, they really respect me because I'm very, I say to the artist, how is the situation legally, tax. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult now in Europe with taxes, with um, artists and things. I don't know how mm -hmm. it's in America, but in... It's not easy. Okay. Europe is very difficult, all kind of rules. And, mm -hmm. and I think contracts are a very important thing because you don't uh, lie to nobody, nobody lied to you. And agents... Uh, it's a very important thing, but sometimes they don't do enough work. <laughs> so in the end of the day, mm -hmm. like gallery, you need to go to the artist again, and you say to the agent, please get involved also. You know, so that is, for example, one of my experience with agents. You know, they are okay, they bring an artist, excellent work, but somehow they let you in the middle, you know. So I like, ex for example, now I visit an artist of myself. Here is Mataro Perecol. He's a very good artist, Catalan, and I was spending a day with him in his home, eating with him, looking at his work, not spending $100, no, <laughs> but spending a day. But for me, it was very important to right. know the person, what I'm working with him. You know? So I think contracts, I really uh, recommend it to everybody to do contracts and not to be afraid from this world because it's a business, it's a a transparent thing, and mm -hmm. it's an industry even, and it's uh, also to the artists, the problem is that the lot of artists, they don't know all the tax rules and all the things that a gallery had to do. Mm -hmm. And when you say them, you know, the difference with tax or the Kunstler Social Kasse, for example, in Germany, we need to pay, it's, I don't know how it's say in English, Kunstler Social Kasse, you know, I need to pay like a security of arts, even social security. social security, even if yeah. I sold a paint from a Chinese artist or Mexican, I need to mm -hmm. pay 5% of his price to the German authorities. You know, even if these artists don't receive the money, but I need to do it. So the artists need to know also. So they are all kind of expenses. You must to make also conscience to the artist that it exists. And me, like an artist, when I sold my job, I also know how it's doing, how it's working the things. Exactly, because you are somebody who believes in transparency, which is a word we discuss all the time in the business, yeah. but also clarity. Very and Clarity important. comes from an ability to be a good explainer. Yeah. And the idea to sit down and have 
the art of explanation between two people so that the contract is clear, the understanding is clear, the responsibilities are clear. Um, I think that's very much what you're doing. Um, I know when an artist joins our gallery, one of the things I ask them to do is to write me a letter and basically say, what do you expect of me in this? And then we sit down and we go through the points. And I say, OK, we can do this. This will happen over time. Let's give it a little bit of, this one's open for conversation. Yeah, so that we have this document that we're discussing in front of us. Yeah, you can always move things or discuss. Or exactly. It's an organic barrett. relationship. But as long as you have clarity, um, it's open for discussion. And I think that's what the artist gallery relationship's about. And also, art can change the world. I look like, like you. It's very important. I yeah. also love art. You know? I didn't say it changed the world. can improve. <laughs> okay, improve, changing, okay. evolution. Yeah. So I think art is a very important role of evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, not, we need point. to be on this, you know, that we forget already. Yes. But uh, if it's not clarity, you, know, you lose things. And it's, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very important. Artist, agent... Taxes, lawyer, everything open and clear, and uh, you can't uh, avoid a lot of problems. Yes. Okay. Let's get a question up there. Um, first, I have to say that I think it's a great idea to be discussed. I'm not so sure if it's a great idea in itself, but I, I think it's a great idea to be discussed. But I have some remarks regarding the way you suggest that you should be rewarded, that you should be get paid. I mean, that the agent uh, would, would have sort of a success fee. And I'm not so sure about that because obviously it will tend to direct his artists to the galleries where we'll get a better chance to get money. So I'm not so sure if that's the way it should be. I'm, I, I think a fixed fee would make more sense. On the other hand, I think this is a service much more to the artist than to the gallery. I'm not so sure if the gallery should pay. What do you think about it? Good, nice point of view to be discussed. I have no against, I'm not the, I don't have anything to defend. It's just um, a point of view. Um, I believe that a fixed fee is not aligning the interest and I can tell you from finance, anything I do, I want the people I am having my counterpart to be aligned interest with me. I win, do a win. Uh, you know, and to get an artist, honestly, to pay upfront something or to commit to whatever happens, whether you sell or not, I don't believe it. You believe it, it's fine. It's to be discussed. Uh, and the galleries, again, I totally agree, but I really strongly believe that if it's a right professional platform, it will provide a lot of services to the gallery. And I believe, because I really believe in businesses where everybody is happy to pay. You know, I don't believe in something forcing. I believe that at the end, if you provide the right service, you know, you don't have to go to a lawyer because you're a great to think you don't have to solve those tax problems because you need to, uh, you know, I, I, so many different things. You can provide a service of the production, who's going to be the, doing the production of that leather things you want or find that metal piece that you want. I think it's worth uh, remuneration, but it's, that's a different point of view and it can be discussed. Elizabeth said, promised me a very tough question, so I want to <coughs> hear that. <laughs> I just have some comments um, and from my own experience as, as a gallerist too. Uh, the idea of an agency is uh, in some ways bringing us to a place of scale again. If we have a very executive team running you know, the careers of over 50 artists, we're talking about a pretty big corporation. And uh, what Adam was saying about uh, clarity and about understandings. Uh, I, I think when you get 10 people in a room talking to each other, you have less clarity, <laughs> <laughs> not more clarity. Um, so you know, in doing this, which has the vision to make um, things more efficient for everyone involved, are we just setting up a structure that's inherently more daunting than what we're dealing with now? Mm. And um, you know, for instance, I, you know, this is more prevalent in the American gallery system right now than the European one, but in New York, uh, PR is a big deal for galleries, for their exhibitions, for their shows. Uh, so even galleries that are of the scale of mine with five employees, we have, we have had PR agents work with us because the idea is it's more efficient than having someone in-house. 
Uh, you can go to a Nadine Johnson and have a team of 10 people working on your account. Um, you can, you know, they can organize the dinners, they can do talks and book launches, they can work with the social media site, which is very time consuming. Uh, they can work with the artists, they can illuminate things. What I have found is, not in all cases, but in a lot of cases, and I've heard this from other galleries, the problem with an agency is that they spend more time getting new business than they do actually maintaining their existing accounts. Uh, because their model is they have a lot of expensive mouths to feed because these people need to have you know deep experience in order to be qualified. So uh, you can have an Aging Johnson uh, and they can do certain things uh, or you can have like an Andrea Schwann kind of person who doesn't have an assistant who works completely for herself. She represents um, Hauser and Wirth and then works with Hauser and Wirth's in-house PR uh, specialists that then you know, assist and collaborate, and she becomes part of their team. And, and that has been seen to be, in some ways, a, a more uh, a good approach. We have started uh, hiring our own in-house PR. And the reason for that is when you leave a relationship with an agency, you also leave the network. So uh, like for independent, for instance, this was, a, this was a, a mm -hmm. big question that came up, which is if we have a PR company handling our mail mass mailings, and our VIP lists, and our, our door lists. Uh, and these are members of the press, some of which we have in-house. But if you have a, an agency for a period of years, and those writers go to different publications, they go to other places, you have a situation in which uh, you have a really out-of-date list when you've left that relationship. Mm. So how is that fortifying the organization and the organization's growth and network? Um, but I do think there is a huge potential in the idea of um, production. Um, there are certain artists, yes. particularly in the upper tier, you know, I, who really need like a DreamWorks production studio to find really ambitious financing for major films, major large-scale installations, things that have to really go across the world and tour. Um, these things can be for museums, they could be for large platform galleries. And I think that the financing and the production also comes into a legal aspect. There's a lot of um, scope of work. There's a lot of, uh, just a lot of things that have to be considered. And I know that most galleries want to develop the idea with the artist, but being a project manager is another job. So that could be outsourced. Hmm. No. Good point. Good points. And about the size, um, you are right and, and wrong um, in some sense. Again, size. Uh, Again, taking my helicopter view of the art world, you know, I see a couple of giants. I see a very two couple of b huge giants, and that's why I keep saying that's what I'm saying in that article. I mean, and and even Mark alluded to this. I mean, who are the t some of the toughest competition for galleries? It's still auction houses. You know, auction houses is 1,100 people working for them. 1.1 billion dollar market cap at the minimum depending on on um, on the on the stock exchange mood so you know at Basel is a big as organization not that big but it's about 20 25 full time I think 45 now. <laughs> yeah, exactly so but uh, because I know that depend yeah with the three fairs you're totally right so 45 I mean you're talking about s uh, bigger service things I mean you're talking about the transport companies mm -hmm. the, you know you you in a way, having the scale is an advantage for everyone. I mean, so of course you don't need a, a big thing. Don't imagine that you, the artist will enter a building in Wall Street and uh, go up the floor 10 and then floor 12 and blah, blah, blah. No, come on. Of course there will be something accommodating. There will be one point of contact only. Uh, one person of contact only to the artist, which will then bring along the table some different competencies when it's necessary. That's the way I see it. Again, did I do it? No. Did anybody do it? And you, it was mentioning that because everybody's referring to existing agent. I don't think that model I'm describing existing right now. So let's not compare to what existing of people calling themselves agent because right now it's one people's stuff and they kind of promising the moon, but sorry, but I'm sorry, what, uh, what is the added value they bring, really? Uh, except for some knowledge, like, like uh, the art advisors. Of, of course, they know the art market better than the artists, but do they really bring something really useful? Uh, 
at the moment I don't see it. And, and I'm watching, you know, when Amy Capellazzo uh, studied the adventures, she talked about artist agencies, and I, w I said, oh wow, she knows, uh, and that, the w that will be the one that will do the job. Um, but she kind of moved more to a state. She didn't say really she wanted to represent artists. But in other sense, you know, when I started talking about it in this article, I had, um, I had, had CAA contacting me from Los Angeles and asking me, oh, what do you have in mind? And we're starting to think about it. So, you know, I, I wanted to share it with you because I think it's in the air. Um, Look at Josh Roth and UTA. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's also... Hollywood the agency that is now starting to represent artists. There's also the potential <coughs> on the emerging end for this to be useful, more in a coaching situation. You know, how to set up and professionalize the studio for the first time. What kind of, um, you know, corporate entities need to be in place. Um, how do you handle your taxes? How do you handle... Before you have a gallery that has the resources to refer you to this kind of um, assistance, you know, you do need... Um, a lot of infrastructure, and it's a big investment um, to start that. And a lot of artists come out of school, and they're really not that well equipped to do that. And then, hopefully, they find a good gallery who can assist them. And we've done that a lot over the years. But you know, I could see that being a really useful role uh, on the emerging side. But in terms of the mid-level galleries, what we really need, um, we need financing to buy work of our artists, um, and we need to have. Um, access to capital to take certain kinds of risks, either in production or in um, you know, catalogs or things that are really critical to the moment of a certain artist's career growth and development. I think we need that. And you know, we also need, just on the legal front, a lot of assistance to the artists, both in terms of copyright, particularly with digital uh, video work, which I know the work you're doing a lot is really um, important on that regard. But, you know, I find that like the John Silbermans of the world and the other major lawyers kind of act as artist agents already in that. Um, it's just, it would be nice to have those resources for artists that are less successful, that aren't pay can't pay John Silberman a thousand dollars an hour or, you know, the gallery picking up the tab, but, you know, slightly more efficient economical situations that do provide that kind of strategic legal advice in terms of image reproduction, um, and issues around intellectual property. I will come back to that seminar I had on, on preservation. You know, they had guys from the MoMA, Rhizome, and so on. It's so advanced in terms, it made really, I wrote it on my Twitter, it made me ashamed of the way I'm collecting digital art right now because it's really a mess in comparison with what I should do, okay? But I, I said to them, you know, it should be taught in art school what you are saying, explaining the kind of the rules. And, uh, and Rafael Lozano Hammer put online on his Facebook page what he considered with his experience should be the kind of the things that an artist in digital art um, should be doing. So I agree with you. Again, honestly, I would really think that right now a kind of a professional association should give that. I mean, uh, sorry, but for me, professional association is certainly some galleries association, but also some artists kind of things, you know. Why, why not, and that's why I really like what, uh, what uh, some good galleries like GB Agency, uh, Mott and so on did with that gallery program at the Apple in uh, Holland. You know, it's kind of saying, okay guys, just to save you time as young galleries, come to this and we're going to explain you what are the mistakes not to make and everything. So I think, yes, um, the industry, again, is because it's not individual. It's not you that has to do it. It's not everybody does it separately. But why not to kind of define some best practices to um, even to artists, as you said, you know, when you start your career, uh, Lisa was mentioning it, uh, you know, consignment. The number of time I heard artists giving works, you know, OK, my show is, is to, to tomorrow, so I, I, I delivered thing. So you deliver, deliver, deliver many pieces, no documentation, no consignment agreement, no nothing. And one year and a half, two years later, you want to get them back. Well, you don't know what's, what's, what's delivered on that famous day. Uh, there's no consignment agreements. And, and then the troubles are starting. I mean, of course, there are kind of guidelines that you should have. But I think as well that it should be an industry level. And I keep pushing for best practices in the art world. Because right now, those best practices would eliminate a lot of, of, uh, of problems mm. um, and maybe reduce the use of those artist agents, which I'm very fine with. Uh, you know, no problem. No artist agent, I'm very happy with it. Time for coffee or? Yes, yes I think That's so.
in case there is just one final quick question, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I, when you were explaining your idea of a platform, I thought it was a quite a powerful idea because I think that as a small or mid-sized gallery, um, such a professional platform could help us a lot to get off our backs a lot of work that we are uh, that are distracting us from doing uh, our job, let's say. Um, nevertheless, uh, coming back to this, I need a bit of you to a bit um, that you help me to um, fully buy it. Uh, in terms of when you were explaining it, uh, I came back to this marriage analogy, and I thought a third person is never a good idea in a marriage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was wondering, you <gasps> indicate. So I thought in the operational aspect of this collaboration, like in the daily work, how should it work? And I, I thought you already gave partly an, a an answer when you said that it's like the agent of the actors, they have agents and managers, so the manager would be the gallerist. I think this analogy was mm -hmm. made. So I wonder if you could elaborate more, like what are the roles of, I don't, I'm not so familiar with the acting scene, so I don't know what, what are the roles of a manager and an agent? For me, they were pretty much the same. I use the analogy because it's a Hollywood system and it functions very differently than we do in the art world because I play the role of the agent and the manager. I'm the gig getter and I'm the money guy. I get the money, I make the money happen, I negotiate the sale, and I make the shows happen. I get funding for museums. Um, I take the two o'clock in the morning call when somebody's hysterical. And Alain has uh, put forth this concept that there would be an artist agent who would handle everything sort of outside of the sale and promotion area or what a gallery would do more specifically related to the advancement of the finances or, or the financial health of the work. For me, it would be a negotiation with the gallery. You know, it would not be a one rule yeah. for everyone. I'm sorry. It, you want to keep this, but you said, I mean, I'm sorry, I spoke to this gallerist in Paris, she said, she lost three kilos, I don't want to speak to these artists anymore. She loves her, and she loves her work, right. but maybe it doesn't match, uh, so maybe it depends, again. And again, I have no real answer to your question, because pff, look, let's see how maybe sometimes someone will start this thing. As a summation, monogamous marriages work for some people, <laughs> having a mistress works for others, and we have yet to see what works for everybody. So how about that? <laughs>